and get started. First of all, welcome to the kickoff of the fourth winter lecture series. Uh, hard to say that when it's going on 85 degrees out, but this was actually scheduled for January uh, and we encountered 30 plus inches of snow. My wife, who's in the back, was petrified I was still going to try to get in. But fortunately, the director of USAHEC canceled on Thursday based upon weather forecasts, so you all were notified in time, I hope. I'm, for those that don't know, I'm Marty Andreessen. Uh, I am not an expert military historian nor a genealogist. I come with two very important criteria. One, I'm free. And two, we live close enough that I can get here in most weather conditions. We also have in the back of the room the director of the USAHEC library of which I'm affiliated with as a volunteer. Normally that would bother me and make me nervous, uh, but I retired 25 years ago, so what are they going to do? Send me to Vietnam? Today's agenda, by the way, we're going to be focusing on World War I and World War II military records should run between one and one and a half hours, then you're free to uh, adjourn to the Ridgeway Library to do follow-up research. We'll be handling questions and whatnot. First of all, some admin. I spent seven years teaching cadets, so I understand the need to ask questions. Don't feel you have to wait till the end. Just whenever a question strikes, wave your hand. Wave it vigorously. I'm 2200 with glasses. Again, USAHEC does not possess official military records. We do not have individual soldier records. Those are all the property of NARA and maintained out in St. Louis, where every 10 years they have a fire to make room for the next batch of records coming in. Uh, finally, we will not be doing any pulls today. However, between the electronic card catalog and the reference collection, we can get most of you into the right church pew so you'll know what to ask when you come in during a, a weekday or a Saturday between 10 and 5. Now, this is an election year, so there have to be some paid political announcements. You're all encouraged at the end of this presentation to go out the door, turn right, turn right, and have lunch or a cold drink at the MWR Cumberland Cafe. Then you're invited to go through the museum gallery to include the newest exhibit, the Vietnam exhibit, and magically you'll end up having to go out through the gift shop. I do believe there is an international or UN requirement that any museum you exit through the gift shop. The, for those of you that uh, are consumed with work, et cetera, et cetera, the Army Heritage Center Foundation, our private support group, does have a researcher for hire program. So you can actually uh, rent a historian to use the resources here. Finally, for those of you unaware of it, the South Central PA Genealogical Society will be having their annual convention down in York on 24 September. Uh, you, those attending will see me but probably not recognize me. For the 79th time since retirement in 93, I will be wearing a tie. I so hate ties, I keep track of the number of times I have to wear them. 24 September, 24 September. Now, some of you are wondering why I have both a handheld mic and what appears to be a lapel mic. Two reasons. One, I'm technologically challenged. And second, one feeds sound to the camera and the other allows you all to hear. This is the first time we've tried to videotape a presentation, so it's a whole new experience. I asked for royalties. They're still laughing. 
Okay, what are some of the basic tools you need? Well, let's talk about military records, first of all. 8 September 1565, we established, the Spanish did, St. Augustine as an outpost. From that date forward until the mid-70s, we have been engaged in constant conflict, which means large numbers of adult males served in the military and had military records generated. Mid-70s, we went to Volar, the all-volunteer army, which has changed the complexion quite a bit. So for many of you doing genealogy, you work along and you find these gaps. Check the gap against one of the conflicts. War of 1812, Mexican War, Civil War, whatnot. And it may be that the ancestor you're following went off to war. Now, when I say military records, that's generic. There are two components to military records. There is the service component. This is where you have all of your training and your assignment orders and whatnot. Then there is the veteran component, the pensions, the bounties, uh, the VA, and the like. So one is generic military records, and then whether you're looking for the service record or the pension records. Pension is not an issue for the 20th century unless you retired from the military, but VA disability payments is, and that's a component of it. Now, as I say, military records can be a valuable source of information. They can give you the place and date of birth of the individual, place of residence at the time of enlistment or mustering in, be careful. Large numbers of males would move from one area to another, some to enlist several times, uh, all for the state bounties. That was a problem in the Civil War, not so much for the 20th century. And more importantly, oftentimes they will give you a physical description of the individual. Height, weight, color of eyes, color of hair, scars, Today it would be tattoos, names and ages of family members. Now, all of that sounds great, but keep in mind that military records were created by the government for administrative purposes, not for genealogists. So it's like a treasure hunt. That information is contained in a record somewhere. It's just a matter of finding that record. Now, <coughs> For those of you that have served in the military, you're all aware of the 20th century, the official military personnel file, uh, oftentimes referred to as the 201 file. This is the file you really want to get your hands on. It deals with date and type of enlistment or appointment, duty stations and assignments, normally through official orders that are part of the folder, your training and qualifications, for example, if you're a ranger, there'll be a certification in, in this folder that you're a ranger. If you pass jump school, uh, there'll be a certification. And let me tell you, no matter where I put the damn canteen, I landed on it. It didn't make any difference which side. I still managed to land on it. You'll also have performance reports. These are the non-commissioned officer and officer efficiency reports. Probably those will not be readily available unless you're the veteran himself or herself. Awards and decorations, documentation. Disciplinary action, particularly Article 15s. Insurance, as mo most of you may know, World War I, World War II, uh, soldiers had the opportunity to purchase insurance at an extremely modest fee. Today, the insurance uh, is provided by the government for soldiers and it, it runs rather substantially, but unfortunately you have to be killed in combat in order to, to uh, get it. 
emergency data. So if there's an accident or an incident, they know who to get a hold of. Uh, and there are many times things come to a halt when the personnel folks look at a file and say, oh, we don't have any emergency data. We have to have that. Uh, so when you get married and whatnot, you have to make sure you update it. So there's a lot of information you can find there. Also, you will find the form of separation or discharge, the DD-214, uh, whether you're discharged honorably or you retire. It may contain, and this is driven primarily by financial considerations, it may contain copies of birth certificates, marriage certificates, divorce decrees, and the like since all of that impacts on a soldier's uh, pay. So you can really hit the mother load uh, unless the file was destroyed by fire and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, in order to begin the process of accessing somebody's service record, military records, there are certain things you need to know. Period of service or at least the war. Uh, and Cold War can work if you can put some parameters on it. Two year enlistment, three year enlistment and the like. Service number, serial number. These you can get online through a variety of sources. They started in the 20th century in 1918 and were terminated for the Army in 1969 when we went to Social Security numbers. The armor branch, were they Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, Coast Guard. Remember during times of war, the Coast Guard becomes one of the uh, combatant organizations. Otherwise, it's under the Department of Transportation. Were they enlisted or commissioned? Uh, that can be helpful. Nature of military service, by this, were they a regular by God army or were they National Guard or Selective Service draftee? Now I avoid the use of the term militia. Many of you have experienced working with militia. A little bit of background. The militia was a process by which virtually every male adult served and they would train four times a year, one time a year depending upon the nature of the threat. The militia is best thought of as just a body of manpower. So when there was an actual threat, the militia would be formed up and they would ask for volunteers. And when they didn't get volunteers, the state or the colony would provide a bounty uh, or make certain pledges about land allocations. Or if you're killed or wounded, we'll take care of your family. So the militia is not really an organization that you would be interested in in terms of a specific period of conflict. Now, where do you acquire that basic information? Oftentimes, and names can be tricky by the way, Schmitz oftentimes became Smiths. Uh, when they came from Ellis Island and whatnot. So you really need to narrow it down. Oftentimes a family Bible can provide that information. Uh, most families, particularly southern families, have a, a family historian that has that. Photographs. Photographs started during the Mexican War and sometimes with a photograph you can see the uniform and from the uniform you can figure out what war and uh, if there's a shoulder patch, you can even figure out the unit. We'll go through that here shortly. Oftentimes tucked away in a, in a dresser drawer will be some special orders or other official documents like Uncle Sam wants you report at such and such date. That can provide some useful information. County courts oftentimes will have information. And let me digress here for a moment. <clears throat> when I retired in 93, uh, Carlisle Barracks stipulated very clearly that a copy of my discharge, DD-214, 
should be placed on file at Cumberland County Courthouse. The reason being, in case of my demise, it would be easy to access and prove that I was one a veteran, etc., uh, etc. Et now we no longer encourage folks to do that, mainly because up until last year, the DD-214 contained social security numbers. Under sunshine laws, those are open to the public. So veterans are being encouraged to retrieve their DD-214s if they in fact filed them with the courthouse. Technology is not necessarily wonderful. Yes, sir. Uh, Uh, yeah, some states and counties have gone to that. Uh, whether it will hold up or not, we're not sure. Uh, it's much like the 62-year rule for the federal government that I'll talk about. Uh, I'm not sure I would want to risk a court appeal, to be honest. Uh, but I think maybe if they argue that it has Social Security numbers, uh, they, it would stand up. Yeah, we started with social security numbers in the Army in 69. Uh, surprisingly, today the Army also considers uh, serial service numbers to be confidential uh, until 62 years after removal, and I'll talk about the 62-year rule uh, and that fundamental change since some of you may have been dealing uh, with 20th century military records. Uh, also, don't forget the possibility of school records. Your local newspapers, uh, many of the older issues are on, on uh, microfilm. You can go through that and oftentimes in smaller communities it will indicate specific names having been called up and going to Fort Devens for mobilization or FIG, uh, Indian Town Gap uh, and whatnot. Many of you may find uniforms tucked away in the, the closet. My wife found one. She said, that's not even your patch. Uh, no, it was given to me ultimately for the museum and it's still in the closet. But they will have shoulder patches that can get you a unit. They will have uh, a distinctive unit insignia, the little metallic uh, heraldry device on the flaps that can get you into a regiment or an artillery battalion and the like. All of that can be helpful as you're pursuing uh, somebody's uh, military service. Many of you are familiar with the fact that census reports every 10 years uh, are now online. Many of those will reflect that at a particular time, snapshot, individual was a veteran. That can be helpful. And now we move into the fact that next year, in April, we begin the 100th anniversary commemoration of World War I. Europe started in, 19, or in 2014. They've been commemorating now for two years. But we did not enter until April of 1917, so we will start next year. Now I'm going to cover some basics on both wars very quickly. It's not of any great interest except to historians. Uh, World War I, World War II, First World War, Second World War, those two are kind of standard terms you can use when doing uh, Google searching. For World War I, it was also known as the Great War, the war to end all wars, which it didn't do, 
the war to make the world safe for democracy. So those are some other terms that you could use. In most cases, you'll end up with the same websites. Uh, or you can save all of that by just using the quick reference guide provided to you. World War I was fought on fronts. The Western Front, where the bulk of American soldiers served. The Eastern Front, which was primarily the Russians. Uh, the Italian Front, where we did have some U.S. forces involved, uh, to include some volunteers, such as Hemingway, who served as an ambulance uh, driver. The Balkan Front and the Near East Front. In World War II, we had theaters. The European Theater of Operation, the Mediterranean Theater of Operation, the Pacific Theater of Operation, and one that is seldom remembered, the CBI or the China Burma India Theater. Uh, unless you were in CBI, it tends to be much like Korean War, the forgotten theater. After World War I, uh, U.S. forces served in both Siberia and northern Russia. Uh, one of the most famous of the Army regiments, the 27th Infantry Regiment, picked up its nickname there, the Wolfhounds. Uh, and they are now on their 35th or 36th uh, Wolfhound mascot over in Hawaii. Uh, where, quite frankly, uh, the, reg the Wolfhounds have a roster of who's responsible for caring for the dog that week. Um, now, in World War I, soldiers were known as doughboys. World War II, GIs, or government issue. The doughboy, near as we can tell, came about because of U.S. service on the U.S.-Mexican border, 1914-1915. Uh, it was very hot and dusty, and we had mostly cab units down there. And as they were going back and forth, they would be covered in sort of a white dust and became known as the doughboys. And it just carried over with them. Now, in World War I, there were some 37 million casualties killed, military and civilian, 9 million of which were soldiers, obviously not all American by any means. World War II, there were 50 to 80 million killed, of which 23 million were combatants. World War II, to the date that we know of, has been the deadliest military conflict. As a result of both wars, the maps changed drastically. World War I saw the demise of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Russia. World War II saw the breakup of the colonial empires. World War I led to World War II. World War II led to the Cold War. So there's sort of a symmetry there, unfortunately. World War I, the American Expeditionary Force, the AEF, that's actually the force that moved across the ocean uh, and fought on the west the bulk of it on the Western Front. The AEF consisted of three major components. The regular army, which was divisions one through eight, and we had somebody that was coming perhaps from Westchester that was interested in the fifth. That was a regular division. Please note, I refer to them as divisions. In World War I, we did not have infantry, armored, cab divisions. We had just divisions. We weren't that specialized by any means. The second division is somewhat of an oddball. You may have had a relative that was a Marine but serving in the second division and you're very confused and oftentimes will think it's the second Marine division. No. One brigade two infantry regiments and a machine gun battalion in the second division were in fact U.S. Marine Corps personnel. At one time the Army Division was commanded by a Marine, Major General Lejeune, and it suddenly dawned on you, oh, Camp Lejeune, now I understand. So Marines were 
serving in the U.S. Army at that time. We then had the National Guard divisions. These were geographically oriented that were mobilized the 26th through the 41st. 28th Pennsylvania, the 29th Maryland. And some of you are saying, the, what about the 42nd, the rainbow? The 42nd is interesting. Unlike most wars, when the U.S. declared war against Germany in World War I, state governors and senators began to pressure President Wilson to be the first into to combat. Wilson finally conceded that we had to create some sort of special uh, organization. It became the 42nd Division. 26 states and the District of Columbia all provided National Guard troops elements to that division. Uh, the chief of staff was Douglas MacArthur and he made the comment that the division is like a rainbow that stretches across the country and so the 42nd not surprisingly became known as the Rainbow Division and it did in fact fight uh, as part of the AEF. Now you have the, the national divisions, the 76th through the 91st Division. These were the draftees. These were the results of selective service. Uh, Uncle Sam calling folks to war, uh, mobilized and whatnot. So each of these components you need to understand to be able to figure out where records may be. For National Guard divisions, you're likely to find most of the important records at the state level. The adjutant generals were responsible for maintaining those records. They were National Guardsmen subject to the orders of the governor, mobilized, and then oftentimes released back to the state. So you'll find a great deal of information, hopefully at the state level, for National Guard divisions. Now there's also the 92nd and the 93rd divisions. They fought in Europe as well. We were a segregated army in both World War I and World War II. These were African American divisions with white officers. Four of the regiments from the 93rd were actually given to the French to use as attachments. World War I, we fought with what was known as a square division, two brigades, each brigade having two infantry regiments and a machine gun battalion. That's an awful lot of generals floating around because each brigade was commanded by a, a brigadier. In World War II, in order to cut down on all of the uh, chop lines, if you will, the coordination requirement, we went to a triangular division, three infantry regiments, all commanded by colonels, all subject to the division commander, and it made for a cleaner organization. A World War I division numbered about 25,000, a World War II division, about 15,000. So you got 10,000 fewer soldiers to worry about. Now in looking at the records, you would think because of technology and whatnot, 20th century genealogy would be a lot easier. It's not. Simply because we're dealing with millions now of records uh, and you're dealing with thousands of names that are the same. You're dealing with service numbers that it's very easy to transpose. Uh, they're generally six or eight digits to a service number. Uh, and folks have numbers change. I started out as OF104595. And then that disappeared just after my wife and I memorized it. Uh, and it was given a new one. And so you're, you're dealing with all sorts of quirkiness, not even including the gigantic fire of 73. Now with service and serial numbers, as I mentioned, these are key and essential. Most of them can be retrieved online. 
they started in 1918. Interestingly enough, particularly to our library director who can pursue this with the director of USAHEC, number one service number went to a master sergeant, Arthur Crane, same spelling as our director. <laughs> I don't, I actually don't know if there's a linkage or not. Not surprisingly, the first officer serial number went to John J. Pershing, who commanded the uh, expeditionary force. Uh, except the officer numbers were not assigned until after the war. 1920, and Pershing was given the number one. Uh, and it was also in 1920 we began to use uh, prefixes and again the master sergeant uh, Arthur Crane was given an R in front of the one because he was regular army. Uh, you begin to get into all sorts of coding uh, for aviators, uh, cadets and whatnot. Uh, most of that you can dig out off the web don't need to go through a big laundry list of all of that. There are some interesting things though regarding service numbers. Uh, I have the service number for uh, Clark Gable who, who was an officer. Uh, his first three digits were 565. Ronald Reagan also an officer. First digits were 357. Why almost 300,000 difference? Well, because Ronald Reagan actually got his commission in 1937. He enlisted in 1934 in the enlisted, off, uh, enlisted Corps Reserves, took extension courses, took an examination, and got his commission in 37. So he was much, much lower in terms of serial number than, than Clark Gable. And no, John Wayne never served. He just made movies. Uh, the Fighting Seabees, The Sands of Iwo Jima, and several others. Uh, also, not surprisingly, Elvis Presley had a service number. His started off with U.S. because uh, he was drafted. Muhammad Ali recently to pass past does not have a service number. We all know that situation. Now, <clears throat> records from World War I and World War II are in fact the property of the National Archives and are stored out in St. Louis in a new facility built in, 19, er, in 2011. It was dedicated. That facility is three stories. It covers seven acres. It has the capacity for a hundred million military and civilian records. They receive on average 1.5 million requests for records a year. That breaks out to five to six thousand a day. Which may explain why it takes some time to get feedback. One of the things I find interesting is they have a staff of 700 and they're very proud of their parking facility for the public which has 700 slots for staff and public. And I'm looking at 700 employees and 700 spots. Get there early if you want a parking place. Now in 1973 uh, Around midnight on 12 July, there was a devastating fire that lasted for 22 hours. Guestimate is 25 million records, service records were destroyed. But quite frankly, we have no idea of knowing because large numbers uncounted had been transferred over to VA uh, at that time. They were able to reconstruct about six and a half million. So we're still looking at, by their guesstimates, uh, a substantial number that have been lost. Now I will tell you that when you write to the National Personnel Center or you send an electronic request, SF-180, you're going to get in all likelihood the response, there was a fire. There was. They do not specifically state 
that the records you're interested in were destroyed, just that there was a fire. Today, they reconstruct records only when requested. And they have the ability to reconstruct a great deal of records through the VA, through the states, and the like. So I argue, go with the three-letter rule. By the third letter, they decide, okay, you're not going away. Let's see what we can provide. Uh, many of you may have only done the one letter and been told there was a fire and move on. Uh, continue to pursue it. The other trick, if you can afford it, is they have researchers for hire out there as well. They've established relationships with the civil servants working in that center uh, and oftentimes over coffee, hey Charlie, can you help me with this? And it, it can move along a little bit quicker. Now, let's talk a little bit about access to the records. The 62-year rule, which was developed uh, a few years back. Prior to the 62-year rule, in order to request access to a veteran's records, you one, had to be the veteran, or two, the recognized next of kin, be it spouse, be it the eldest son or daughter. I've experienced, unfortunately, doing genealogy back in those days where the young son is the one that wanted to find out what a relative did during the war, but the next of kin, the older brother, said, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, and sort of think about Thanksgiving dinner in that scenario. We now have the 62-year rule. From the date of an individual leaving the service, and today it would apply to 18 June 1954. Prior, after 18 June 1954, those records are the property of the service in which the individual served. The National Personnel Record Center is merely the storage location. And so you still have to be the veteran or the next of kin. After 62 years, those records are accessioned by the federal government and the National Archives. They now are subject to the Sunshine Laws and quite frankly anybody can request access to an individual uh, service member's record and be told that there was a fire and whatnot, but be that as it may. You will not get access to finance records or to medical records. You will get the basic where the individual mustered in at, where he trained at, what units he was assigned to, uh, awards, decorations, and the like. Now, the National Personnel Record Center also can assist family members in replacing uh, lost awards and decorations, predominantly medals. And yes, in World War I, we did not have Purple Hearts, but in the 30s, there was the opportunity to request a Purple Heart if you could document that an individual had, in fact, been wounded or gassed. Uh, today, we're in the process of doing that for Vietnam medals. But this is the opportunity where you can, can make shadow boxes and the like by requesting replacement medals if you can't find the European Theater Service Medal and the like. Now, also available out at the National Personnel Records Center, uh, although, again, a challenge to get to are burial files, claims files for pensions, awards where you've requested uh, awards, pay cards, you're not going to get access to those, uh, court martial case files, unfortunately you can get access to those, 
And morning reports uh, and unit rosters. Morning reports are interesting, as all the veterans in, in the audience know. Every day, every unit submits a report identifying who's on leave, who's in the hospital, who's TDY, who's uh, PCS, permanent change of station, and en route to their new units. Uh, you go through about 400 of those uh, for slightly over a year and you can pretty well tell uh, a great deal of information about the unit and perhaps an ancestor. Now, many of you are still saying or thinking that, okay, fine, I, I really don't necessarily want to deal with the National Personnel Records Center. That's just a gigantic bureaucracy and it's going to take years. There are some other uh, places that you can approach. As I said, for National Guard personnel, take a look at the state. Many of the states, and I've got a couple examples up here for Vermont and South Carolina, publish detailed information. Yes, sir? Well, I'm going back to what you said, burial files. Yes. Uh, you go on the National Personnel Center's website, which I've provided on the quick references, and you work through the various uh, levels and it'll tell you what form you have to submit and attempt to get access. In some cases, to be brutally frank, you can get access quicker through some of the uh, .com genealogy websites. Some you get a 14-day free trial, get all your questions laid out in advance. Uh, others like Ancestry.com, they have various fees for various levels. Family.com provides a 14-day free trial. So I would sit down in advance of using up your 14 days and think of all the various things you want to know and then use the 14-day free trial. Uh, and don't think six months later you can go back in for another 14 days. It doesn't work that way. They, they, they have the ability to keep track. Use a different computer, uh, a different uh, email address, that would work. Excuse me? What was that website again? Uh, Family.com. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's also little known that there is a, uh, many of you are aware that out in Salt Lake City is one of the finest genealogical libraries known to exist, uh, run by the Mormons. There is in fact in Mechanicsburg uh, a small little annex which has access to uh, the big computers out in Salt Lake City. Uh, you cannot just simply knock on the door and walk in. You have to sort of schedule in advance. Yes, sir? Backing up a moment to the unit roster that you mentioned. Right. For what wars, how complete? They go all the way back to the Revolutionary War. They are as readable and as complete as the designated company clerk was. Many of them are extremely difficult to read, the earlier ones. The conventional wisdom going around is that 20th century records are all by individual, not by company or company. Generally that's true, except they do have unit rosters, and that's an alternative means. So if you know which one you have. That's right. And you can oftentimes get that from the shoulder patch, the distinctive unit insignia, uh, in some cases, if grandma has a letter that has an APO, we have a reference guide of where the APO was located at uh, in Europe. And that then will tell you generally what units it could be. 
this works well for divisions. It doesn't work so well for the separate battalions, the signal, the quartermaster, and the like. Those are just tough. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can, as I say, that's one of the reasons I, I pulled a, an APO reference guide. Uh, the other advantage to an envelope is it required that the individual identify the unit that he served with down to the company. So unless that got torn off, that can also be very helpful. Most division histories, by the way, that we have uh, World War II do have rosters in them, which is helpful. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I used a researcher. He said, like you said earlier, that the VA could supply a lot of records. But he, this researcher said going through the VA is very, very difficult. And he suggested going to your state senator and have them contact VA. What's your experience been trying to get records from the VA? for somebody, say, from World War II? It's a hell of a lot easier to get an appointment than it is to get the records. I'll leave it at that. Uh, I, I'm retired military. I would never encourage anybody to go to their uh, state congressman or uh, senator. I will tell you that in the Army, if there is a congressional inquiry, we have 10 days to turn it around. I have no idea what the VA uh, requirement is. That's a separate organization. But the last thing we like to see is a congressional inquiry. Because <laughs> there are strict timelines. And, and some of them are just impossible to deal with. Uh, but that certainly is an individual's option. Uh, and for those of you familiar with the VA, I was not being overly critical when I said it's easier to get an appointment uh, than it is. And you know that some of those are running years. Uh, some of the other areas. Uh, unit patches. There's a book up here. If you identify the, or see the patch, we can identify it. This one just happens to be open to the 25th, my old outfit. I don't know how that happened. If you find the distinctive insignia, the little metallic device, that will help find a unit and then you can find out where that unit was organic to what division and this happens to be open to the two artillery units that I was with. Again, just happenstance. It just, it just fell open that way. We have a tremendous number of unit histories in our collection, World War I and World War II. Most larger units, World War I, regiment, brigade, division, have been digitized and are online. So you don't actually have to come in to look at a 300 page uh, unit history. This one happens to be of the 5th Division. I pulled it because an individual called uh, earlier asking about the 5th. It is online. Uh, so if, if you want to go through, you can quickly find rosters, uh, etc. Okay. Yeah, this is the 5th Division, World War I. We also have a tremendous number of battle campaign histories. Not likely you'll find much there, but it gives you a sense of what your ancestor experienced during a particular the Battle of the, the Bulge, the Ardennes campaign, uh, etc. Uh, veteran associations. Many of you are saying, well, I'm looking for somebody World War I. There's no veteran association now. Many of those units carried on, and they all have a designated 
historian that has uh, a garage filled with stuff. If you can find that it still exists, the unit, and tap into that, that might be helpful. Uh, for some of you that want to, go to your VFW and American Legion and, and hang out. Uh, vets tend to only talk to fellow vets and they will do it at the American Legion VFW. Uh, occasionally you can find information out that way. Oh yeah, I remember Charlie. Uh, we served together in the Pacific. Uh, for Pennsylvania, for those of you dealing with it, most states, and I know Pennsylvania specifically, offered bonuses to uh, citizens that served. And in my case for Vietnam and Iowa, they offered a, a bonus. I had to submit more paperwork to get that bonus than it did to get into the Army to begin with. Uh, but it becomes very useful and most of Pennsylvania's uh, information is available in Harrisburg at the State Library. Uh, it can be, yes sir. Uh, yes, uh, which may or may not involve a fee, uh, but right, yeah. Uh, but that is very useful and oftentimes very comprehensive. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Right. Right. And then from there you can go to unit history's battle campaign and get a, a good flavor. Uh, yeah, all of that is uh, uh, extremely useful. Uh, it, it is a treasure hunt. Yes, sir. Just to follow up on that, there is important genealogical information in the compensation applications. Yes. Parents, if they're living, why minor children, right. that, as well as birth places. I've got an example of people who want to look at after the election. All right. And be sure if that information is on the second page. So if you're looking at a microfilm online, say, through Ancestry or another place, you know that brings up a, a good point for World War One and World War Two. Uh, generally, the key document that involves discharge is a two-sided document. The front side is, in fact, the information about when they joined the service, uh, campaign, battles, etc. Uh, if you only have the one side, which is the, in effect the DD-214, the, the discharge document, uh, don't be confused that the individual must have served in the B Company 1st Battalion uh, REPL replacement. That's just simply where they were discharged. Uh, everybody went to sort of a central location for discharge. That's not in all likelihood the unit they actually served with. Uh, one advantage you do have for World War I and World War II, uh, when you find a unit you can pretty much count on the individual having stayed with that unit unless killed or seriously uh, injured, wounded, and pulled back. Unlike Vietnam where three tours, seven units because uh, every six months you would change. Uh, that becomes much more difficult. Any other quick questions? Sir? What about merchant marines? Uh, merchant marines have their own set. Just simply go in and Google uh, merchant marines and work through all of it and eventually you'll find a place where you can 
request records. Uh, much like VA, don't expect miracles. Yes, ma'am. The Navy has a facility similar to ours. Uh, all of the discussion today about the National Personnel Records Center is same, same for Navy and Marines. Uh, they, they all fall under the, the National Personnel Records Center. Uh, for 20th century, it gets a lot more complicated 19th century. Uh, Eighty percent of the, the loss were army records, yeah. Uh, and we're now discovering that quite frankly uh, it, there, there weren't that many lost that could not be reconstructed. Uh, the, the caveat being of course that now they only attempt to reconstruct a record when there is a, a request for that record. Which is why I say the, generally the three letter rule, don't, don't give up after the first letter. There are some other sites that can be useful. Uh, if you go on Google and go to the Doughboy Center for World War I, for all wars, Cindy's List can be useful. And as was pointed out, the Pennsylvania Service Medal Cards uh, those can be helpful. Anytime you are using Google and any of the websites identified on the quick reference, please make sure you have some sort of virus screen, uh, AVG, whatever you may use. Uh, the last thing you want to do is bring your computer down through a virus while attempting to do this. And all of us have experienced, take good notes. Six months from now, that critical piece of information that you want to expand on, where did I find that? Oh, I didn't document it. Uh, we've all been there. To include commandants, when I was in uniform, got a call from the commandant, I'm doing a speech and I have this great line, tell me where it's from. Uh, so, by all means, document carefully. There, there are forms that you can use. I think most folks prefer developing their own. I mean, you can get commercial trees and whatnot. But. Sir, yes. I just here. Sure. You said earlier about if somebody's trying to back into a person's unit. I was in the Army Air Force. <laughs> Yeah. And in those years, the word Air Force and Air Force was used interchangeably, although there was a rule. Yes. And I think in 1949 or whatever, when the went blue suit, that was another story. But if you're looking at an Army discharge, World War II discharge, I was Army Air Force, Army Air Force. Right. My discharge says U.S. Army. Yes. The following it was signed by a lieutenant colonel at Fort Bright, North Carolina. Right. What I'm saying is, you could have been on the Air Force, but separated at a field artillery post or whatever. So that can be confusing if you don't know it. You just want yeah. to assume, well, he said he was on the Air Force, but here's a lieutenant right. colonel at the field artillery signed his discharge. Right, those, those were the, the mustering out headquarters and whatnot. Yes. By the way, generally uh, you would find the code AAC for the Army Air Corps. Uh, now I will tell you firsthand, and he's absolutely right, uh, in 47 when we created the U.S. Air Force, large numbers of individuals who had been Army uh, slipped over to the Air Force and both Maxwell Air Force Base, which is the Simpson Research Center, which is the Air Force equivalent of here, uh, we would do Donnybrooks over who was going to get what unit history and what record. Uh, and it's tough to split a unit. Well, this was Army Air Corps until October of 47, then it's yours, but we get the unit, you know, 
So quite frankly, it can be tough to find documents on an Air Force veteran who served Army Air Corps because you're not really sure where to look. Yes, sir. If you were looking for orders promoting a soldier, yes. where would you look? Uh, National Personnel Records Center in the, uh, in the service file. They, they will be in there. They'll, they'll be listing uh, much like when you're, uh, for a commissioned officer, appointed temporary grade 1 January 1944, permanent grade 1 November 1950. All right, so that's looking at an individual LFPS. Yes. But there must be a copy of the Well, there would be trying to find those uh, is contingent upon the company clerk and, and the company commander having uh, being historically minded and squirreling that away someplace. Uh, that, in all likelihood, uh, you could work through morning reports to find because it w a morning report would reflect when PFC Smith became corporal. But that's still not finding the official order directing the promotion. Now, rather than go through 31 or 30 morning reports every month, right. could you start with the unit rosters, which is presumably monthly? You could, and, and discover that, okay, somewhere in June he was PFC, in July he's corporal. Uh, and don't be surprised if in August it's back to PFC. Uh, folks went up and down rather rapidly. Uh, I was assigned to Korea in 65 and had a signal sergeant uh, who was a, um, to our way of thinking, a straight sergeant, buck sergeant. He had been a master sergeant three times. Uh, he just payday and booze did him in. And the army was a little more forgiving back then. Uh, and the real kicker is when he retired, I was at the retirement ceremony, he retired as a major. Uh, World War II, he had reverted uh, after World War II from commissioned to enlisted. Okay, it's been my pleasure to zip through this. Uh, there is one last thing I would like to stress for World War I, which may help some of you. In 1919, the federal government mandated that all information pertaining to an individual soldier be transferred to the state adjutant general for the state in which that individual identified as home of record. For National Guard Division, that wasn't uh, hard to do. That means that theoretically at the state archives, state library, or TAG, all of the information, critical information, should be available. Some of the states, not Pennsylvania, published it. And you, you can come up and look at Vermont and South Carolina, uh, multiple volumes. Connecticut did it. Uh, Virginia did it. Uh, all by 10 or 20 years later, but it's still in there. So 1919, Congress mandated that that information be provided to the states. That's another possible approach to avoid having to deal with VA or the fact that the records were lost in the fire, or at least that's the claim. Yes, sir? Well, you brought up World one. I had a question for you. I don't know if you have the answer, but it's something that puzzles me. I'm a historian, we make them up. <laughs> I'm a historian too, it doesn't make it doesn't help. So maybe no. uh, there were two rounds of, of registrations for the draft of World War I. Actually three. Two commonly. Yes. Do you have any idea why there's an overwhelming preponderance of people putting down a date of birth one year to their actual date of birth? I've done hundreds of World War One draft registrations. Reviews, and I have found about 60%, 70% of people have the wrong date of birth by one year. Now, 
it's not simply to they serve as people. Sometimes to make themselves older when they're too old to serve already. Right. So I didn't understand it. Have you ever do you anything about that? Yeah, take a look at the European method back in those days for determining birthdays uh, and whatnot. Sometimes there's just a slip. It's like my grandmother. The only people she ever lied to about her birthday were the Social Security when it started in the 30s. Of all people not to lie to, that was the one. She made herself younger. <laughs> Yeah, I would pursue the fact that a large number of, of countries other than the U.S., uh, you start off at one. So if you arbitrarily forget where you're at and whatnot. Have you seen that as well? I mean, yes. That, right, it's not, not uncommon. Yes, sir. Well, for National Guard personnel, it's almost as extensive as the federal government for uh, uh, Army. No, these are records uh, that would be for their National Guard. The records I'm talking about are for those who served in the AEF or other uh, areas. Uh, large numbers of soldiers, by the way, served in the states. They were forming the training base and whatnot. All of that information, when they were mustered in, how they came in, where they served, etc., had to be provided to the state. Uh, so that information, I, I can't conceive of any state arbitrarily destroying that information. Uh, but then stranger things have happened. Yes? Think of the 201 file as the service record and go through the National Personnel Record Center, the three-letter rule, because I guarantee you they'll tell you there was a fire. Uh, but the, the 201 file is, is the equivalent of the uh, official personnel management file, the OPMF, which is, in fact, the service record. It's fairly thick and by the time you strip out uh, pay and whatnot, medical. Sir? Sir, we have in the neighborhood of a, a third of a million books. The strongest suit are our unit histories, uh, Civil War. Uh, I mean, if you want to know about Gettysburg, you know, as I like to joke, 236 linear feet of books about Gettysburg. Uh, but we have uh, virtually every division and regiment, both wars, unit histories. We have all of the Civil War units, uh, either in hard copy or on uh, microfiche. We have some 3,500 large manuscript collections and 2,500 small. Uh, by large, the Military Assistance Command Vietnam is 762 Hollinger boxes. Uh, this is a typical Hollinger box. So unless you have years to spend, uh, and we have some, did have some 1,200 boxes of Hershey papers. I think we had the name of everybody he ever brought in under selective service. General Hershey was head of selective service for decades. Uh, we have just under 2 million photographs. Uh, these are not, although we have the official signal corps, most of them our private photographs, uh, mom and dad taking Johnny as he's sitting on the stoops of the wooden barracks or going off to, to muster and whatnot. Uh, of particular strength is the Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States, a Civil War collection known as Mollus, a uh, hundred and some volumes. We obviously have artifacts courtesy of our our museum and you're invited to walk the mile trail if you want to right out here. Uh, we have, yeah, 
I, the library director knew I was going to bring this up. We have some 337,000 military pubs, army regs, field manuals, technical manuals going all the way back to early 1800s. So we can pretty well trace uh, what the reason we keep these, among other things, veterans will have been discharged in 45 and told one thing about what their rights are, but the regs change so frequently that when they go to VA, VA said, oh no, we're not subject to having to do that. And they will come to us and get the specific paragraph and date for that regulation to be able to show, look, when I was discharged, this is what it said. Uh, some of those personnel regs, by the way, have 36 changes. So you really have to work through. Uh, we do have also on site the Army Heritage Center Foundation, which is a private not-for-profit uh, support organization. It built this complex as building that uh, both through grants from Pennsylvania and private donations. Uh, they run the gift shop. Uh, they handle the used bookstore where you'll see the book racks outside. Uh, they have a, an annual membership and you can get information about it if you're so inclined to wish to support it. Yes, sir. Yes, they have researchers for hire. You go on the website and uh, go National Personnel Record Center, Researchers for Hire, and then just go through and check out fees. And not all of them are located in St. Louis. Some of them are down in Oklahoma. Why they would agree to it? I guess they wait until they can batch process. Uh, but if you go on that route through Google, you'll be able to find no, no, no. Just go into National Personnel Records Center Researchers for Hire. The reason for that is if you just put in Researchers for Hire, you'll get ours, you'll get down in D.C., you'll get uh, some of the state libraries. The point is that the, the, the NPRC website itself has a link which lists Researchers for Hire that specializes in this area. That they've approved, yes. Uh, well, I don't think they've Now, under federal law, they have to, yeah, it's, uh, but just as we try to maintain uh, uh, that, you have to include anybody who wishes to be on it. Just like we cannot recommend a specific hotel motel in the area, we can only provide a list of all the hotel motel, and then the individual can make a choice. Yes, sir. I thought, oh, I, Rodney, I thought I saw your hand up. Can you speak to the uh, application, application and usefulness of the individual deceased personnel files in the U.S. Army Human Resources Command Fort Knox, Kentucky? There is one, and it is usable. Uh, it's, like all databases, subject to the the foibles of the individuals uh, submitting data. It's much like the hundreds of volunteers that submitted information to the Civil War soldier sailor list. Uh, I, I would not rely on it. Yes. They, they can do that, yes. Uh, oftentimes, though, there are published rosters with service numbers of those individuals killed, and it indicates the unit they were assigned to at the time of death. Uh, but you need a magnifying glass because of uh, the, the fine print. Also, don't forget the American Battle Monuments Commission for those that uh, uh, remained overseas. 
they're very useful. Any other quick questions? Yes? Yeah, I got the morning reports from my father, traces movement across Europe. And then, of course, the after action reports generally show it for his regiment. Was there ever anything kept for individual companies, like an after action report for the company, other than a morning report? Technically, the regimental after action report is the product of the three battalion after action reports, which are the product of the four company uh, after action reports. Generally, seven of those disappear <laughs> in order to just go with the regimental. You could luck out. After action reports are maintained at the National Archives down in Washington. Uh, we have large numbers of, of photocopies that an individual provided. Uh, but at the company level, unless it was a unique assignment, you're not going to find uh, easily company level. It was in a headquarters company. Mm -hmm. It was an observer, so they were gathering intelligence. So I was wondering if maybe they hung, you know, kept records of that. Uh, your best bet there is to find the reports from the regimental G2. Not the regimental after action reports, but the separate G2 is code for the intelligence. Uh, G1 personnel, G3, the be all end all, the operators. Uh, but the G2, uh, S2, you, you may find greater likelihood that they were kept under those. It, it's a treasure hunt, folks, any way you look at it. Uh, it's, it's like popcorn and chocolate, though. Once you start, it's tough to stop. It's my pleasure. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Hopefully, you've picked up some things. You're encouraged, as I said, to have lunch or a cold drink. By all means, visit the gift shop. Uh, the, the foundation will appreciate that. And I will migrate down to the reading room to assist with the use of the electronic uh, card catalog and the reference sources for those that have further questions. Thank you.